Hyde Park. We are Boston's new home for classic R&B and hip hop. Urban Heat 98.1 FM and 1410 AM. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this show are those of the host, guests, and callers and are not necessarily those of WZBR, its management, affiliates, and advertisers. WZBR and the Urban Heat holds no responsibility for the validity and or accuracy of information on this show. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann, and I understand the importance of Black mental health. That's why I decided to start my own show on the urban heat. Black mental health matters. Join me on Sundays at 1 p.m. where we will discuss interesting topics and meet experts in Black mental health. Let's talk about the mental health issues facing our community. Listen online at heat981fm.com or download the app 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. See you then. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams, and I'm a psychiatrist practicing right here in Massachusetts. And this is a talk show that's related to all things about mental wellness in the Black community. So if at any point during the show you have any questions or comments, just give us a call. Our phone number here is 617-238-7111. And we're also streaming live on Facebook for the page for 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. So you can go to that Facebook page to join the discussion, leave a comment, let me know that you're listening. And you can also add me on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Carrie Ann. That's D-R-K-E-R-R-Y-A-N-N. So guys, this Sunday is the last Sunday of our special series, our Summer of Scholarship. And so every Sunday in the month of July, I've been featuring scholars from the Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health at William James College. And so today we're gonna be talking about representation in the field of psychology. And I have with me two scholars, uh, Tia Rivera and Lanisha Allen. So welcome to the show, welcome to the show. Um, So Tia Rivera is a third year doctoral student concentrating in children and families of adversity and resilience and African and Caribbean mental health. Tia is uh, is a lead mentor for the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy and a recipient of the Diverse Student Leaders Scholarship. Lanisha Allen uh, has a master's degree in mental health counseling. Uh, She is a Black Mental Health Graduate Academy administrator. She's also an advocate and social justice activist. She's a second year doctoral student and her area of concentration is children and families of adversity and resilience and clinical health psychology. And again, guys, today we're gonna be talking about representation in the field of psychology, um, which is basically the importance of having provided providers who share aspects of your racial and cultural background. So I want to learn a little bit more about you guys. Um, Tia, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Okay, well, um, I am African American and Puerto Rican, born and raised in uh, New York City. So I'm just out in Boston for grad school. Um, I have experience mainly working with children, adolescents, and young adults, mainly in like the middle school, high school, and college range. Um, and those are some areas that I, um, some settings that I have been in. Um, some of my interests are um, mainly in the realm of like suicidality, um, anxiety, depression, um, mainly around black and brown um, children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, and yeah. All right, that's great. And Lanisha, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, We're really happy to be here. So my name is Lanisha Allen. I am a first-generation college student. I was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, and then around the age of 10 years old, I moved to Connecticut, and later on, I moved to New York. Um, My minor is in African and Caribbean mental health, and some of my professional interests include, you know, in implementing psychotherapy and psychoeducation into innovative solutions for complex trauma. Um, I have extensive experience in residential, um, inpatient, partial hospitalizations, outpatient, and in-home therapy for underserved communities, specifically working with the f- entire family system. Um, it's something that I, I genuinely love to work with mental health um, concerning Black and Brown communities. Wow. I mean, it's it's, uh, such a privilege to have you guys both on the show today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why it's even important to think about representation, about having providers who 
share racial and cultural heritage? Maybe Tia, tell us, start us a little bit and maybe Lanisha can add a little bit. Why is it important? Well, I feel for a lot of racial and ethnic individuals, like it's rare to find a clinician that looks like you, um, especially in the psychology realm. Um, you know, while racial and ethnic minorities represent, you know, 30% of the U.S. population, there's 90% um, of mental health professionals are identified as non-Hispanic white. Um, and that speaks volumes, the numbers itself. Um, so just having someone who looks like you means so much walking into a field or walking into an office where you're not anticipating to see someone that looks like you. Yeah, and Lanisha, anything to add? Yeah, I think representation matters because it can shape how minorities are viewed in society and in the mental health field. Um, it also shapes how they view themselves. And so historically, the media has shown, you know, many underserved communities and many minorities um, different perspectives of how we are portrayed. And I think the source of how people learn you know, who are different is from the media and the different realms of how we are um, receiving information. So I think representation is very important. Um, as Tia mentioned, you know, Black representation is 13% of the American population. And even in just 13, 2013, only, you know, 5.3% of psychologists were Black. And today it's less than 5% of Black students who are even enrolled in mental health counseling um, graduate programs. And so I think it's really important to make sure that the representation is based on the, you know, us in, in showing up and not just the stereotypes that are deemed in society. Right, right. And I, you know, I think about how, um, you know, previous shows, we've talked a little bit about the systemic factors that affect racial and ethnic minorities that because of, uh, you know, systemic racism and, and systemic bias, there is disproportionate poverty, there's disproportionate exposure to trauma, and then therefore there's some uh, kind of disproportionate expression of, of mental illness. Um, you know, when I think about kind of mental health counselors and social workers and school psychologists and marriage and family therapists, do you guys have a sense of how many of them um, are actually represented by racial and ethnic minorities? Yeah, um, so there's around 15% of mental health counselors who are represented for um, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, 8% for social workers, 5% for uh, school psychologists, and 5% as well for marriage and family therapists. So, oh, so there's, there's a way to go. There's still a way to go there. A long you know. way to go. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, for you guys, is you guys are making a difference in the world. I mean, you are part of the emerging force of representation in the field of psychology. I wonder, Lanisha, what does it mean to you personally to kind of be that person that represents um, and can uh, be that person in the room for your client? What does it mean to you? Well, first, it's, it's a privilege to be um, a client's go-to person. And so for me, I, I held it as one of the highest accomplishments and the highest um, in regards to, you know, the safety and complex space in which clients are able to talk about who they are and representation and just being there can really reduce harm and bias and discrimination. So to have the privilege to be in a space with clients who can share their experiences um, is, is really a wonderful thing. And I think it's important that, um, you know, a lot of times we're called experts, but it's important to make sure that clients are really the experts of their lives. And so we are just there as their cheerleaders, as their as their point guard, as their A1, day one, to essentially help them navigate their difficulties and navigate their experiences to really grow and develop into being their true authentic selves. Well, I like what you said there about the idea of who, who's the expert in the room. Um, I think that's a really important point, and it's one that I often... Um, you know, talk about when I when I work even um, with trainees that I supervise is that whereas as a mental health provider, we're the expert on mental health diagnosis and things like that, the, the client is the expert on their own experience. And so we have to respect 
their experience. Um, and I can see how if you have representation, if you have someone in the room that kind of may have a sense of what you're going through, that could help enhance the therapeutic relationship. Um, and so Tia, tell, tell us a little bit about what it means to you uh, as an African-American and Puerto Rican to be that person to represent um, in the mental health uh, office. Um, it means a lot. Like me, said, it's, it's definitely a privilege. You know, I, I remember, um, I think one of my first cases in my first year training where I met with one of my clients and like, she was very shocked to see someone who resembled anything close to, you know, her life and who looked like her and that feeling of her being like, even her saying like, oh, like, I want to do what you do. Like, I want to like sit and talk, like how much schooling is that? Like her asking questions, like, I was like, I'm making a difference. Like, I didn't even know it at the time, but like, it's so heartfelt to like, see like the spark in someone's eye when they see like someone who looks like them. So like, it, it means the world to, to be in this position and to almost be, you know, in that doctor role, psychologist role. So it means the world. Well, I mean, and I think about as a young person in this country, if when you're growing up, and if you're in need of mental health services and the only providers that you see are people that are that are not your racial background, it can seem so unattainable that this could ever be something that you could do. Um, and, you know, so many of our clients actually really, when they start to feel better, they want to reach out and help other people. A lot of them also want to go out and become counselors themselves. Um, and so it's it's from what you're saying, it sounds like then when they see, you know, someone like you as in, in that position, they think, oh, this is actually attainable. I can do this. I can be a psychologist, um, you know, and, and that, you're right, it, it can change the trajectory of someone's life because that person may not have kind of reached for that goal prior to meeting you. Um, and so, you know, do you see, you know, do you guys kind of see a visible, like relaxing or, you know, sometimes we talk about this idea of code switching and, you know, for listeners that may not be familiar with the term code switching, you know, it's basically this way that minorities kind of change their outward presentation to make other racial groups feel comfortable. So a black person might change the way they talk or they might change the way that their hair looks to make their white colleagues feel more comfortable because it's technically they're working in a white space. Um, and so this idea of code switching, do you find that your clients um, feel like they less of a need to code switch when they're with you? Yeah, I see. I see some head nodding yeah. for uh, people that are kind uh, of um, <laughs> watching on Facebook. <laughs> yes, absolutely, uh, Dr. Williams. I mean, we talk about this all the time. It's like this balance of being this authentic professional, and there are cultural components that may be understood differently from someone who represent um, similarities within your culture. And so those things can kind of include like psychological symptoms, behavior, the family system. It's different when you walk into a space and a client, you know, I've had many clients turn to me and say, girl, I need help. And for me to say, okay, so what's going on? You know, like, tell me what's going on. And so for them to be able to divulge into their life experience and their childhood trauma and, you know, things that are going on in today's society and in our country and not feeling like they have to show up as somebody else is, it, it, it's crucial and it's really, it's really critical in regards to their progress and treatment. And so code switching essentially stops at the door once they see like, okay, this person looks similar to me. Now they have to explore the relationship. So I think it's really important to the therapeutic relationship and the alliance to really think about you know, the comfort and the nonverbal cues and the reduced code switching to, to really help the client to reduce the pretending and to being someone else. That's what we're, we're essentially ex ex expecting them to do and we're hoping for them to do is to really fall into self-actualization and really discover themselves and not in a space of what society thinks they should be or what society thinks that they are, but their true authentic self without, you know, white fragility or white supremacy is really just for them. Wow. And so, so Lanisha, tell me if you ever run into issues where clients start to get too familiar, overly familiar, maybe starting to ask you, girl, where are you from? Or, you know, and, and usually as, 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 you know, uh, counselors, we don't divulge a lot of personal information in a therapy room because we don't want the 
the treatment to be about ourselves. You want it to be about the client. How do you guys, do you guys see that for one? And if you, if so, how do you manage when clients become so curious, they, they're not used to seeing black providers and they start asking you personal questions. I mean, how do you handle that? How do you interpret that? Absolutely. Um, it happens all the time. Even you could be working with a client for over a year and they're still curious about you and your life and your experiences. But I think it's important to explore the client's interest um, in me more than to get, you know, into talking about the details of my life and the intersections of my experiences. I, I hope to get to the root of the question. And usually I'm quick to ask, you know, well, you know, why is that, why is that important to you? I feel like the therapy space is your space. There are many responsibilities and many barriers that you face on a daily basis. What would it do for you to know about me? And so sometimes clients are really curious because they want to know, you know, are you truly for me? Are you the culture? Are you representing me? Can you really, you know, help me with my symptoms? And can you really help me long term in treatment? Can I really change? And so once you get to the root of that, to me, I always flip it and talk to the client about their hope and their resilience in regards to I'm here and I'm committed to treatment, but are you who you really say you are? Wow. So, so you try to get to, when, when they ask you personal questions, you take a step back and say, what, are, what is it that they really want to know? Um, you know, and in some cases, depending on who the client is, they want to know whether, they, they might say, oh, you look young. I want to know if you have experience. Um, or they might say, I want to, you know, know uh, whether you're, you're properly uh, licensed or whatever the case may be. And then, as you mentioned, it sounds like in some cases they want to know basically how, how much do you know about my culture? How much would you really know about me? Which then kind of leads me to the, the thought that what if you could have a provider and a client who are both black, but maybe don't actually have very much in common? They may come from different um, places geographically, maybe the South versus the North. They may um, have a different socioeconomic uh, status. They may um, have uh, just different interests and ways that they express themselves. How do you, maybe I'll ask Tia, like how do you, how do you navigate or what would you recommend for that situation where they're both black, but they really actually, that's the only thing they have in common is their race, not really anything else. Like what, what do you do? Yeah. Um, I think a good starting point is definitely not assuming. Um, there's definitely that like aspect of like, oh, like she gets it right. Like she's going to get that. And that you, you can't throw that on everybody because everyone's life with like, with like race and ethnicity, everyone's life goes in different trajectories, different experiences where, you know, I might not understand that cultural aspect. So a big part is like not jumping to assumptions and also at the same time being very curious um, you know, and being, um, having some humility, like being like, you know, I'm not really familiar with that experience, you know, do you mind, like, we talk about that and diving into culture while you're talking with this, with your client, because at the end of the day, like you said, like, we can both be Black, but there's just no commonality there in terms of our, like, ethnic culture, and just being really curious and really exploring that with somebody, I think is very important. Yeah, that kind of leads me to the, the idea that not all black people are the same. And, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes we'll say for uh, our white colleagues that if you get a referral and it's a black patient, that doesn't automatically mean that you must pair them up with a black uh, clinician or psychiatrist because those they may not actually understand um, the person's background um, in the way that you might expect. And so it really should, the request should come from the client because some clients, it's not important to them to have a, a black provider but for others it is. Um, and these are some of the kind of factors that go into it. I know, Lanisha, I don't know if you have anything to add about, you know, what to kind of, how to kind of think through things when you have clients that people maybe just assume that, hey, you're a black provider, let me send you a black client and this is going to be the perfect match. You know, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I mean, as you and um, Tia mentioned, a shared complexion does not mean black culture is one culture. And so we're diverse, we're a diverse group of people, just like many groups um, within you know, the US population, but even outside of our country. So I think it's important to think you know, about who the person is outside of the Western culture and, and the terminology of being black. It's not used as a racial identity outside of the US. 
So when I meet with other clients who may share similar complexions as myself, I really want to think about, you know, the cultural components, the ethnicity, the nationality, and ask them, you know, so where do you come from in regards to, you know, how do you identify? Are you Caribbean? Are you African, you know, first generation immigrants? Are you African American? Do you consider yourself to be black? Like how, how are we different? How are we the same? And I let the client drive the conversation and I do my research once I know. So I think it's important when I'm sitting with a client, specifically, I've worked with a lot of clients who, you know, are Caribbean and I want to know the intersections of whether they're Jamaican or Bayesian or, you know, what it means to them and really represent their culture and ask them questions about themselves instead of assuming. And once I get that in the intake process, I then want to go and do my own research to find out things that I don't already know about their uh, cultural norms or their family systems. All right. So do your research, people. Do your research. Try to learn about people's cultures and ask them questions, open-ended questions, open-minded questions versus making assumptions. And so listeners, I just want to remind you, you're listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams, and today we're speaking with two scholars from William James College, uh, Tia Rivera and Lanisha Allen. They're both doctoral students. Um, and if you have a question or a comment, feel free to call in. The phone number here is 617 238 7111. That's 617 238 7111. Or you can drop me a comment on Facebook on the page for 98.1 FM, the Urban Heat. So, you know, as you think about the fact that we may not necessarily have um, a lot in common with our clients, or maybe you get a client who's not Black, but they're from a different racial or ethnic minority. Um, what, how, how important is it to find ways to connect with them? Like um, maybe knowing a few words in their language or knowing certain things about their culture or knowing issues about immigration. Like, is there a threat of deportation? How important is it to be able to find those ways to connect with them? And, and what do you guys do? Let's start with Tia. Um, sign off for me. Um, I feel like language is a big um, part that I try to use in um, when I'm working with uh, clients of uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Um, you know, for myself, I only speak Spanglish. Um, and I had, you know, a Puerto Rican client where, you know, she appreciated me even trying, even though it was like, <laughs> most of the time super terrible. Um, but like just that effort of being like, oh, you know, how's your abuela doing? Or how's your titi? And stuff like that. Like, just like incorporating those little aspects means so much um, and build a lot of rapport. Um, and they, you can like definitely see that like kind of that armor that they have up initially kind of come down um, and them wanting to talk more about themselves, even their culture and being even more open to talking about their culture, even when you might not know all the facts. So. so even just trying makes a difference. And I imagine they probably don't see that very often because, you know, I, I think for myself as a physician, when we go through different training and we work with different clients, um, there's not a really a lot of emphasis on trying to learn words in people's language or that sort of thing. But it, it does bring the walls down. You can have people realize that, oh, you're not just... We're not maybe the, the division, the gap gets just a little bit smaller. Now, Lanisha, do you have any thoughts about, you know, you, you mentioned kind of do your research, you know, what are some things that people should know about clients that um, they're working with? Some of it that I think people should know about the clients that they're working with is that they're coming to you to be seen, to be valued, to be heard, um, to be admired um, in the therapy space and they're looking for a space for them. And so I think specifically for me, I think about my own experiences as a black woman and what it has been like for me to meet individuals who have tried to understand me um, versus meeting individuals who don't know anything about me and are not interested in learning about me. And so just thinking about like the racial and ethnic minorities and how they're at high risk for mental illnesses and you know, many other complications due to poverty and systemic discrimination or even exposure to trauma. And I think about my own personal experiences in the medical field or in the healthcare system where I was the patient. And I wonder how far, how much further it could have gone if the physician, MD, therapist, whomever was treating me could have known a little bit about me or even tried to learn my language or the codes or 
to kind of explore a little bit more about me instead of making it about them and their experiences or their implicit biases. Wow. Wow. And, and you know, those are, you know, definitely kind of important, you know, things to kind of think about is how do we, as a, as a team of people um, of all different backgrounds, working with clients, working with patients, try to make sure that we respect their experience and try not to make assumptions that then makes them feel either disrespected by the system or invisible in the system or disproportionately treated. Um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how representation can affect the way that a person's, a patient's experience is interpreted. So let's say a client, you know, you're working with a family and you have to navigate that family system, whether they're a child or even a young adult, you know, you have to understand how family systems work in that culture, or in that family. Um, what, and also, you know, what happens if a client then maybe discloses something that's happening in the family and now you have to decide whether that's something that you should report to the state or whether that's something you should just kind of work through with the family. How might someone who understands a culture a kind of approach that differently from someone who does not understand black culture? Any thoughts, uh, either Tia or Lanisha? I can start. I think it's 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 a great question. I think it's really important to have continuous conversations and debriefing with your colleagues and your peers about cultural differences, especially when it comes to the Black family. And so taking in consideration um, if you should or shouldn't, for instance, file on a client, I think it's really important to talk to the family directly and to offer wraparound services specifically because there have been times where I have met with clients who have felt like their their parental their parents' ways of setting boundaries in in, in in essentially pursuing authority may not have been trauma, even if you know the system believes that it's trauma or abuse. And so something in regards to asking and exploring with the client a little bit more of, you know, how did this experience impact you? Do you feel safe in your home? What can I do to support you? Something that I, I, I really, really pursue with all of my clients is, it's not, especially with adolescents, it's not that I'm not going to tell your parent. It's not that I'm not going to, you know, file. It's that I want to make sure that you and I are together throughout this process. So how are we going to share this with your parents? How are we awesome. going to make sure that you're in a safe space? Wow. So, you know, in, in that way, you're able to balance safety and maintain rapport. Um, and I feel like that takes some finesse, but I think that's another reason why re representation matters because when, they, when a, a client and their family are working with a provider that they trust and they really truly believe understands them, then you can work with them and say, hey, let me explain why this is a safety issue and why we have to kind of talk about it, but that we don't have to lose a therapeutic relationship and how this is going to lead to more services for your family. Um, so I think um, that's a, that was a really, really um, great way of kind of explaining how representation can make a difference there. Um, I wonder, do you guys ever find yourself in a position where you're on an interdisciplinary team and you start serving a little bit like a cultural broker, kind of um, maybe influencing decisions of your peers? Does that kind of happen as well? Tia, any, any examples? Or Lanisha? Um, I don't have any examples, so to say, but definitely have heard different stories, um, definitely have talked about this with different peers. Um, just this frustration around having to provide that information for others when there's definitely yeah. that part on your own, like I mentioned before, being curious, doing your, like Alicia said, doing your research is so important. And, you know, we definitely have that have to carry that with us because we have to you know represent and trying to you know be a voice for those who are in the room at the time so we do have that one side of definitely providing some information but also that like exhaustion of like it's not always us like you can always do your own research yourself as well yeah you know? yeah true Alicia any thoughts 
Yeah, I think I've served as a cultural broker for many of my clients, um, specifically in my um, in my workplace, and and I've had to challenge many supervisors or um, you know dis- inter- interdisciplinary teams in regards to talking more about the family system, and so it's really putting myself in spaces to say, oh, well, I'm actually a little bit more curious about this. And I'm actually wondering what you're thinking, because, you know, from my experience of working with this client or even from my own personal experiences, um, you know, these are some of the things that we kind of want to highlight. We want to look at who has power in the family dynamic. We want to look at gender roles. We want to look at cultural roles. We want to look at, you know, is the, is the family a non, you know, a non-English speaking family? You know, are the, the, is the child bringing up other um, parental kind of roles as a child, like we have to really consider the entire picture. And so a lot of times I am inserting myself into conversations and asking more questions to make sure that other clinicians are really thinking about the entire picture and not essentially just assuming that every interaction with um, racial or ethnic minorities are reactions that are um, deemed to be aggressive or deemed to be um, inappropriate or, or, or abusive. And so when I look at other cultures, I, I have noticed that, you know, I can be working with a client and they're white and they will shout and scream and, and use derogatory language. And that is deemed appropriate in their culture. For my culture, it's not appropriate for me to even back talk my own mom, right? And so when I'm working with clients within the, you know, the Black, the Latino culture, I'm listening to their parents talk about the struggles that they're going through. And it's really important for me to essentially navigate those conversations and talk about, you know, the intersections of, of of abuse and how that can kind of um, present itself in adolescence or even in adulthood and really remember my ethical duties in regards to like, you know, is, does the person have a disability? You know, is the person a minor? Is this, you know, an abuse that the person deems as a traumatic event? So it's not, up to me to decide if I'm going to, you know, interject my, my expertise into a family system, but it's my job to ask questions, to challenge my peers and my colleagues to do the research and really find out more about the family before they take any um, additional measures. Wow. And, I, and I, I like what you said also about the idea of even just thinking about behaviors that are acceptable or not acceptable or expected in uh, traditionally white families versus black families versus immigrant families and how some things might be perceived so differently. So right in black families and in Caribbean families, children are not, I mean, expected. They're not allowed to talk back. They're not allowed to roll their eyes. These kinds of very small things that sometimes um, in some families people that the kids can get away with. You can't really get away with that in black cultures. And sometimes it gets interpreted as being strict. Oh, this parent is, she's very strict. And then when you, as a, the black clinician examine it, you're kind of like, this is kind of what every black parent does. This is not different. Um, <laughs> you know, this is, this is not an overly strict parent. This is just the culture. Um, or, you know, in some families, um, you know, if they're yelling at each other, they're just a high emotion family. Whereas then in a black family, they're yelling at each other, they're considered aggressive um, and agitated. And so it's kind of, um, you know, interpreted differently based on the person, the lens that the person is using to, to see the family based on their own experience. So listeners, I want to remind you again, you're listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. And today we're talking about representation in the field of psychology. And I'm here with two scholars from William James College, Tia Rivera and Lanisha Allen. And if you want to call in with questions or comments, you can do so at 617-238-7111. That's 617-238-7111. We're also streaming live on Facebook on 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat, so you can leave a comment there. So I, I'm curious to know what you guys think about how representation can be important when we have white parents who have adopted black children, because I see that quite a bit. Um, and so how important is it to have a black provider for these black clients when that have white parents? Uh, any um, any thoughts, Tia? Uh, I think that you know when dealing with white parents that have you know black children or even mixed race children, there can seem to there can feel like there's like a mis- mismatch there sometimes. 
Um, and like this lack of understanding on both sides and uh, kind of like this detachment from each other. Um, and then sometimes a parent might often feel, you know, a little detached um, and threatened even like by having, you know, potentially a black uh, therapist in the room with like their child. So um, it's, I think it's really important to, to really acknowledge that in that space, really talk about that with both the child and the parent, like kind of acknowledge like, you know, what are you feeling in this situation? What are you feeling? And really try to get that conversation going um, because, you know, it's important to acknowledge, you know, the black child's experience that that parent might not really even really understand um, and having that space to be able to connect them, to have them have that space to really talk about that and really open up about it, I think um, is really important. And having that rep that representation to really explain, like, you know, this per this their child's behavior as not being aggressive, but maybe, you know, just something is going on, like digging a little deeper into that, you know, talking about like, you know, if your child, if you mention like, oh, the child's hair is messy, like, no, it's not messy. Just trying to figure out like ways, like it's just natural hair, you know, all that different aspects of black culture that that white parent might not understand. So then having that person representing, it sounds like what you're saying, there's kind of two different things that can happen. One is there might be a little bit of a disconnect where if they bring their uh, kind of black child to see a black therapist, they may then feel slightly threatened by the connection that the child makes with the therapist. So then they kind of feel like maybe this therapist is offering something that I can't uh, as a white parent. Um, but at the same time, there might also be some legitimate things that they need a little bit of help interpreting, like natural hair is not messy. It is just a different hair type and that they need to work, learn how to, to do their child's hair um, and things like that. Lanisha, any thoughts about, you know, the idea of how representation may be, you know, factored in if you have a family, like a, a blended family like that, where you have uh, parents that have a different racial background than the, the black child? Yeah, I, I mean, Tia mentioned many points that I, I agree with, um, or well, all the points I agree with, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. But I, I also think it's really important when you're working with a, in a family um, who, you know, is biracial, biracial or adoptive family to really empower the family to think about the child in their racial identity development. So I think it's important on, on the initial stages to, to talk about these things and to provide psychoeducation in regards to, you know, racial development and culture and asking parents you know, what their child is involved in and how much are they involved in? What are they looking for in regards to their goals? Because a lot of adolescents specifically, it's ones that I've worked with that are biracial, do tend to come to me and talk more about things that they deal with on a daily basis in regards to, you know, their their body shape or their the texture of their hair or different um, intersections of their personality versus how their, their parents are um, presenting themselves. And so there could be things like, you know, I've had parents say things like, you know, she eats too much. And I've had clients say to me, you know, I have bigger hips, so I have, you know, more weight on me and I'm shaped a little bit different. And I feel embarrassed about these things. And so then to have representation and to sit with another black woman or even a woman of color and to talk about, okay, well, how do you feel about your body? You know, what's important for you? Do you want to feel empowered? Do you feel like you're, you know, too thick or do you feel like you're just right? And essentially pushing that over into the parental conversation of, you know, what do you want for your child? Again, exploring and asking questions and then integrating different, you know, cultural or historical facts about the um, microaggressions or discrimination against, you know, black and brown people, but even biracial children and how that might be showing up in the home. So when I think about stepping over toes when I think about, you know, parents or any authority, authoritative figure or caregiver feeling um, essentially, you know, uncomfortable with my therapeutic alliance with their child, I try to remind them, you know, this is all in the works of helping you to build a closer connection with your child. And so I want to know their goals before I do any of these things. And once I know the, their goals, I'm essentially asking them, is it okay for them to be who they are? Is it okay for them to show up and be authentic and to be forward and to be bold? Because it's not aggressive. If, if anything, they're being vulnerable. 
Right. She's expressing right. herself, even if she is, you know, a little bit louder than you would like. That, that doesn't mean that she's different. It doesn't mean that she's aggressive. It means that she's passionate and she's invested and she wants you to hear her. It does not mean that, or him, um, it doesn't mean that she is going to harm you. And so essentially breaking down those stereotypes, again, representation is breaking down stereotypes, which tend to lead to marginalized and under, underserved communities and groups of these things that people in society think that we are. So when wow. I say to you, she's not upset, She's mm -hmm. actually really invested. And that's why she's a little bit louder because she wants you to hear her. That's what I'm right. seeing and that's what I'm hearing. And then I ask the parent what they're experiencing. Wow. So kind of helping to prove communication and kind of um, helping to, to bridge that gap between the difference in communication styles so people can understand each other, but also uh, continue to encourage parents that have children that maybe have a different background than they are, that it's okay for that child to explore their racial heritage and to explore their racial identity and that it doesn't necessarily take away that from, from your relationship with them as the parent, but that they're going to want to explore that. And there are, there are a lot of um, story that, uh, stories about this that pop up from time to time and news articles and movies of children who at some point in their life want to really go and explore their racial identity um, and you know how their adoptive parents kind of think about that. I wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about colorism. And for, for our listeners that may not be familiar with the idea of colorism, it's really, you know, um, it's something that tends to happen in, uh, in uh, primarily kind of black groups where there's a divide really based on the shade of your skin. So whether you're a lighter skinned black person, a darker skinned black person, but even kind of like a biracial black person that then ends up having different features, different, your hair looks a little bit different, your uh, facial features look a little bit different. And there's kind of these kind of divide, divisions that we, we cause for ourselves really, but they're coming back historically from even the days of slavery where lighter skinned slaves were house slaves and darker skinned slaves were field slaves and things like that. How might colorism enter the therapy room. Um, does that play a role if you have like a light skinned therapist with a dark skinned client? Um, what do you what do you guys think? Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Lanisha. Potentially, potentially. I have had um, clients that I have worked with that have felt really excited when they finally got to meet me. It's specifically because I was a dark skinned um, clinician and they had identified as being dark skin and have, you know, definitely expressed more marginalized experiences based off of feeling like they are not beautiful and they are not exotic and they're not different based off of, you know, media and society and essentially what our country's history has, has told them. And so being able to have those experiences with other clients who, you know, have similar complexions as me has been extremely life changing in regards to really appreciating their own complexion and their own love for themselves as being a black person. However, I also think that there are some other intersections of, you know, dealing with a, um, a client that has lighter skin tones to me and I have a darker skin tone and really, again, thinking about the racial identity and maybe them not always feeling liberated or um, invested in their cultural awareness in regards to being black. And so we've mm -hmm. talked about biracial children. We've talked about, you know, mixed children or mixed people in regards to, you know, where they are in their own journey and self-actualization. So I've had clients that I've experienced that have told me, I don't feel proud to be black. I don't want to be black. And I, and I, and I understand it. Because in our history, it is not a, a, a it's not a badge of honor. It is a scary and really devastating and emotional experience to identify as black and then identify with our history with our ancestors. And so, for me to explore that with them and to ask them, you know, well, well who are you, and and why, and, you know, what are you feeling, and and why are you, um, you know, distant from this and thinking about small things like historically there have been women that have had or men have, that have had more uh, powerful or political roles who have lighter skinned tones and then when you look at our history there's not many women who are darker skinned that obtain those same kind of positions in any kind of institution or, or system and so i think uh -huh. it's important to ask questions and to make sure we're exploring each client's comfort with us 
not just in regards to race, but even within the intersections of our own black community and to say, how comfortable are you with me? Do you feel safe? You're not going to harm me. I want to know about you. Mm -hmm. And allowing them to essentially share their experiences and to be open and honest because sometimes these ideologies come from their own family systems. I mean, I, I'm sure some of the listeners, the listeners can think about times where maybe someone in their family has said, oh, stay out of the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're going to get mm -hmm. too dark. Oh, don't put that much grease on your skin. Oh, you mm -hmm. know, like giving these different myths and stereotypes about, you know, being darker versus being lighter and essentially highlighting them and, and awarding people for those things and not really thinking about the tragedies and devastations of the history of how biracial and mixed children have even come about into our community now. And so yeah. it's really important to make sure that we are, uh, you know, really paying attention and, and honoring all of these experiences and asking questions. And I think it's important for clinicians to be in a safe space and to explore these things prior to coming into this field because wow. so, we're going to be hit with it. So even before they enter the therapy room, that clinician needs to explore their own identity and be comfortable with who they are too. Um, and then when they approach the client, they need to be able to, having kind of worked out their own issues, be able to be there for the client's issues and see them, their issues for what it is and to help guide them through that um, in a way that serves a client and not silences a client or makes them um, feel unsafe. But again, not assuming that just because both of you are black, that that person feels safe with you. So now I want to just kind of take a moment here as we're getting a little bit closer to the end. I want to know what you guys are doing there at William James College to help increase representation in psychology. Because I, I mean, I, I, when I found out about the Graduate Academy there, I was so excited. Tell me a little bit about what William James College is and what you guys are doing to uh, increase representation. Maybe Tia can start. Yeah, so um, WJC really um, prides themselves on, you know, inclusivity, diversity. You know, um, we have opportunities for specialized training with historically and uh, persistently underserved populations. Um, we do so through, you know, our signature, you know, Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health and academic concentrations um, in such as like African and Caribbean mental health, Asian and mental health and Latino mental health. Um, we also have, you know, WGC has two scholarships um, that are designed to attract and recruit and retain um, ambitious future mental health um, leaders from underrepresented backgrounds um, who are dedicated to providing, you know, culturally sensitive uh, clinical care to neglected communities. Um, we also have our uh, Behavioral Health Services Corp, which is a, a paid year-long service and learning opportunity designed um, specifically to attract recent college graduates to work in um, the behavioral health care field. So we're trying and, to, and I just, you know, and I just want to mention there that the sponsor of my show, the Justice Resource Institute, has a partnership with William James College with this Behavioral Service Corps um, to help uh, so people can work for the Justice Resource Institute while getting their um, graduate degrees. And so you guys should check that out. Um, and Lanisha, anything that you want me to know about William James College and the work that you guys are doing there? I think you're an administrator for the academy. I, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful academy. Uh, the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy was founded in 2016, and it, it, the works really started in 2015, but it was essentially um, a touchdown in 2016. And so, like Tia said, it was, you know, created under the William James College Center for Multicultural and Global Health, um, and Global Health and Concentration, Concentrations Around African and Caribbean um, and Global Mental Health Studies. And so something that is, is extremely, you know, wonderful and, and a privilege is that the academy has had 42 scholars from both the counseling, um, the mental health counseling program and the psychology doctoral program who have been, you know, essentially pushing our culture forward. William James College um, is the pioneering um, a, a institution for mental health, essentially in, in you know Massachusetts, and really talking about our mission and you know the ways in which we are providing services 
um, to underserved communities and really finding people from the from underserved communities to represent um, within the mental health field. I am extremely privileged, and this is the reason why I'm here today. And so a lot of you know, we've talked about over um, identifying and talk about rest representation and thinking about my own experiences coming from underprivileged communities and, and coming from the poor and really having to essentially um, navigate different circumstances. I think that William James College has done a phenomenal job at making it their, their mission and their goal to essentially provide services and support historically marginalized and underserved groups um, wow. in our in our country. Wow, wow. I mean, that's amazing. Now, Tia, you mentioned that there's two scholarships. I mean, how big are these scholarships? Do you know? Um, so they are $30,000 annually. Wow, that's a pretty large scholarship. And that's for kind of like, again, you mentioned kind of like uh, recruiting and like retaining um, uh, scholars from different backgrounds. Yes, so um, just looking for, you know, very ambitious individuals who are really looking forward to, you know, being mental health leaders and, you know, um, activists un uh, for underrepresented uh, backgrounds and just being able to, you know, build on their culturally sensitive clinical care. Wow. And so, Lanisha, you mentioned that there's 42 scholars. Um, are they all from minority backgrounds? Um, like what's, you know, what's what percentage of them are like Caribbean and first generation African? Well, the majority is about 60 percent um, being from Caribbean and African first generation immigrants. And so, um, as we mentioned, the academy is really, you know, progressive in leadership and mentoring, you know, people to recruit to essentially help them in regards to being leaders in the field, um, who, especially people who are pursuing graduate degrees in the mental health uh, counseling um, field and in the psychology field. And so we are a really integrated group. So we're not just black, we're not just one group of black people. We are extremely diverse even within our ac academy and we are really happy and proud to share different experiences with one another. Now, who can people contact if they wanna get more information? Oh, of course. Uh, you can definitely contact Dr. Uh, Jamima St. Louis and Dr. Natalie Court, who are our mentors, our role models, our leaders, um, who have been incredible and definitely impactful. And, and, and I will say in my experience, um, they are definitely the, the, type of t the type of individuals, here's my code switch, that have 10 toes down and will advocate and support you individually and culturally, systemically, and, in, and institutionally in regards to policies and laws and, and actually implementing real change within the Black community. Okay, so that's Dr. Jemima St. Louis and Dr. Natalie Court? Yes. Okay, okay. So uh, I guess we'll, as we're closing the show, do you guys have any kind of final words, any recommendations for colleagues working with, um, you know, clients that are, from, that are from diverse backgrounds, clients that are from black communities, um, just general thoughts about how to approach work with them in the therapy space, um, Tia? Yeah, um, like I mentioned before, I think my big motto is just being curious and genuinely curious. I feel like you know, when you're trying really hard, people can really tell. <laughs> um, so just being really curious, um, you know, asking questions, but again, also doing your own work because that's important too. Like clients bring their stuff, but you also bring your stuff as the clinician into the space. So doing that work yourself with working and with representation and working with, you know, racial and ethnic minorities, that's really important. And just really hear out their experiences. Don't jump to conclusions, like listen. So... That's my two cents. <laughs> and Lanisha, any final words about, you know, what you would recommend for people working with black clients? Yes. Uh, don't assume that all of our experiences are the same. I know that we have a lot of tragic, um, you know, events happening in our country, but I think it's important to also make sure that we feel liberated and empowered in regards to the wonderful things that happen in our communities. So there are so many different social activists and advocates who are talking about uh, social justice. But in addition to that, we have other, you know, community things like carnival, we have events, we have, you know, block parties, we have cookouts, we are really a community who, who loves to love on each other. 
you know, we are really big on leading and empowering our own communities. And so I think it's important to not just do research on our country's, you know, history and what's going on in the news. Um, but I think it's also important to think about the good things and, and the quality components of who Black people are and how how much we curate the culture in, in media, you know? And so I think it's important to make sure that they are, we're empowered, you know, and our, and your client feels empowered and feels safe and that they don't have to just talk about traumatic experiences that have happened to them, um, whether it's in this country or, or globally. Yeah. So I want to thank you guys both for, for coming on the show today. I think it was a really, really great show. There's a lot of just important things that we covered. Um, you know, as I, I always kind of say on this show and on other shows, it is, um, for, for therapists approaching Black clients, remember your basic therapy skills, be curious, as Tia said, um, be open, try to see the things through the, the lens of the patient and not your own lens, try not to make assumptions. But also, I think as Lanisha said earlier, some of these things you need to kind of figure out before you ever enter the therapy room. You need to figure out your own racial identity. You need to figure out your own implicit biases. I think on uh, the show last week, we talked a little bit about how you, um, the, the client, when they come in, they need to inquire of their therapist whether they've even considered that they might have Im implicit biases towards people of different backgrounds. And if they've never really thought about it, then you know they're not going to be able to be aware of it in the therapy room um, or even be able to address it when it comes up. They may be thinking that they're colorblind or you know other kinds of erroneous philosophies. Um, and so it's so important to really approach uh, things from a place of culture cultural humility, but also as Black providers to also to not make assumptions that you understand that what your client is going through, because again, you may not have as much in common with them as you think. And even if you came from the same neighborhood, that person's experience is theirs. So you really need to approach it the same way you would um, any kind of therapy client, but just bearing in mind that you need to check out your blind spots. Um, so if you guys want to learn more about how to, um, you know, represent in the field of psychology, how to go ahead and get your training in your graduate education, how to become a psychologist, you can go to the website for William James College. Um, I know that the content information for Dr. Natalie Court is there. Um, you can also look up uh, Dr. Um, Jemima St. Louis. Um, and you guys know that I'm here every Sunday at 1 p.m. on 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. And if you want to reach me throughout the week, you can connect with me on Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Carrie Ann. So, guys, good luck on your scholarly journey. And, guys, I, um, listeners, I hope you uh, join me again next week on 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. Talk to you then.